Hi everyone. So this is Harsha Vastav. I'll be presenting the remaining part of last week. Uh, as you, if you remember that last week you were discussing the first half of the session was was about uh, input and sampling. It was a, it was a method to improve the variational autoencoders. So in today's session, I'll talk about some other some other methods of improving variational <coughs> autoencoders. So if you remember that last week, uh, we reached to a conclusion, a theorem that if we increase, as we increase the number of important samples, we get uh, the performance of uh, autoencoder close to the, to uh, the performance, the variational uh, distribution becomes close to true distribution, true posterior distribution. So, so there is a possibility that increasing the sample may or may not be really resulting into uh, the improvement in the performance. So in this slide, what I'm going to show you is a very, uh, very different thing. It's about uh, that we really learn something different by increasing the number of important samples. So what we see here that uh, on, the, on the left side, this is uh, this is variational autoencoder. I, I mean, it's the it's the true posterior, the distribution of true posterior. True posterior is the uh, uh, like we assume that there is a latent variable g, and we want to approximate the uh, the true posterior of the latent variable g. So this is uh, p of g given. So we have four samples. Uh, P of G Q one X two P of G Q one X three. So we have four samples X one X two X three X four. So we see that uh, the 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 distribution of true posterior is like a circle. This is a circle, and this is a circle like it's uh, aligned uh, to an axis. So so what is what is the reason that it is like a circle? So I would like to ask this as a question: Like, what could be the reason that the true posterior is like, like a circle? So, does anybody have any idea? Why do you have a true posterior as a like it looks like a circle? So, so, so uh, on the on the right side we have uh, impotence weighted autoencoders. So for 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 the central uh, this is k equals to five, and for the left. Right part is k equals to 40. That means we are sampling five five important samples, and in, in the second second case, we are sampling uh, 50 important samples. So, so what I'm saying that the true posterior is like is is a shape of a circle. So, what is causing the shape of the circle? So, as we increase uh, on the right side, that uh, if we increase the number of samples, the shape of the circles become uh, different from circle, like. Sorry, the, the shape of the distribution uh, becomes different from circle. It becomes uh, like this shape. Have a what are assumptions? We are we are doing like prior. Uh, sorry, my camera is getting Prior is normally distributed. P of G is normally distributed, and uh, the approximated pro approximate posterior. We also assume that it is also it is also normal. Uh, that is q g given x is also normal. So why? So is there any relationship between uh, p of g given x that is true posterior and prior and approximate posterior? So what is happening? If we see in like if we 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 were, what we were doing, uh, yeah. So one second. So yeah. So when we maximize Variational lower bound bound that we are trying to like in like in previous slides uh, before this uh, before this slides we saw that we are trying to maximize the variational load lower bound. So what we are doing we are trying to maximize the marginal likelihood and at the same time minimizing the KL divergence between the true posterior and the approximate posterior. So so it has two effects when we are trying to minimize the KL divergence between true posterior and approximate posterior. It's not like that we are 
uh, forcing the approximate posterior to become equal to or same to the true posterior. Even the true posterior is trying to trying to assume the shape uh, which minimizes the KL divergence. So this is true posterior on the left. So we, we see that as we increase the important sample, true posterior tries to become, tries to assume a shape which help reduce the KL divergence between true posterior and the approximate posterior. Uh, approximate posterior. So this gives us a hint that, that why do we assume why 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 do we why do not we give more freedom to the true posterior? Because it if we give more freedom to assume different different shapes, we are uh, in some way learning some like we are learning something more expressive uh, distribution. So so th that's how we we decide to to assume uh, to take approximate posterior more ex expressive distributions. We are not imposing. That the approximate posterior would be would be uh, Gaussian distribution. We do not assume now that uh, that the uh, that the approximate <coughs> distribution would be Gaussian distribution. So suppose so so to understand this, we 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 will think about what is uh, the approximate posterior doing. So assume we have a fixed prior P of G. Fixed prior. Suppose this is a, a Gaussian. Gaussian distribution. The approximate posterior Q of G given X has a bin, bin packing problem. What does it mean? Uh, suppose we have an image. Suppose we have an image. Okay. So what we are doing, we are kind of like what, like this is X suppose. This is a, this is a data point. It is uh, the, the approximate posterior uh, uh, Q of G given X. What is it doing? It is mapping the data point into an space, a space of prior P of G. So it's a space of prior, like it's it's kind of a generative network. In, a, in if you think about generative uh, generator and discriminator, so it's what is generated? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, what I'm saying, yeah. There is an image. Suppose this is a data point, and uh, whatever our approximate posterior is doing, it is mapping. It is mapping the data point to a space of prior, or we can say latent space. So we have some data point image, and what the approximate posterior is doing, it is trying to map that data point into another space or uh, a space of late, late uh, prior or you can say latent space so what does it mean like we want we want this we want this kind of mapping as much as possible so that we can recover that image we can recover that image from the latent space so what i'm saying that we want approximate approximate uh, prior uh, sorry yeah approximate posterior q of g given x we want approximate posterior such that it can map that image to a latent space and as well as we can get back the same image from the latent space so this is what the these uh, this line is saying for each data point x the approximate posterior finds a distinct reason in p of g which is a latent space so that uh, the true posterior p of q given g can reconstruct that data point with as little information. That means it, it, it should be very compact as much as possible. It should be as compact as much as possible. So, so yeah, to make it, to, to make this point more. Is that expectation supposed to be on X, right? Sorry? The formula is just because. No, we are, no, no, this is like we are uh, sampling G's. We are sampling G's and, and calculating the approximate posterior and then taking the average that's how we will uh, we will pile all those uh, we will pile all those data points into our latent space are you sure because it's uh, if you write it as an integral it should be p z given x yeah times p of z which doesn't make sense 
it's not time scale of time g of g. g of x. That's how exponential is done. I mean, it's not time scale of g. It's a uh, no. I'm saying if you write it as an integral, mm -hmm. p z c given x times p x p x, then it will become p uh, joint distribution three x. Yeah, like <laughs> integrate out x, and it will become z. The expected value should become p z integral over p z given x times. Yeah, you're c. saying the expectation will come. It should be p of x. Um, you're times. saying that it should be, it will become um, mm -hmm. p of x. Sorry, sorry. That expectation. That expectation. It is p z. It is written. It should be x. P expectation over x. Right, because if you integrate it, you know, yeah, you write it as p z given x times p p x, not p z, because otherwise it will be z. Like the expectation of the z will be multiplied. Okay, okay, yeah, and, and p given x times x becomes a joint distribution, <coughs> and if you integrate out the x, then it becomes p z. Uh, let let me clear it. I think it is g. Why I'm saying, uh, because what we are doing. Uh, so, uh, in simple terms, you can see that uh, we want to uh, uh, we want to get p of g. Okay, so we will sum all g's that, that are possible. Like it's it's a like it's a simply this this p of g equals to um, you can say summation over summation over the joint. Mention over x p z x. That's what you do. That's how you get the margin of the joint. I'll anyway. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll yeah. We can. i have to check check it. So till now, what is clear that posterior is trying to trying to kind of uh, like in the next slide it will be more clear. So what we have here on the left side we have a Gaussian 2D isotropic Gaussian which is our prior P of G. So this is a posterior P of G and X. So what is happening here? Basically, each color each color represents a latent. Like we have four samples, four data points, A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D. So what is whatever prior is trying to do is trying to encode this uh, this uh, this isotropic Gaussian into a new uh, latent space. So this is you can say this is for um, this is Q G given X equals to A, or this can be Q G given X equals to B. Like this, so th this is generated on some training data set. So this doesn't have any semantic uh, meaning. But what I'm trying to show, uh, what I'm trying to show you is that uh, is that we have a Gaussian distribution as prior. So in this uh, space of prior, what latent, uh, what approximate prior is trying to do, approximate posterior is trying to do is encode all those data points into this space of prior. So we have uh, we have this shape, this kind of shape. So the objective of objective of approximate posterior is to encode, somehow encode uh, those uh, samples, data points into this uh, structure. So, so but, but since we have assumed that this, the shape of the space of the approximate posterior should be uh, Gaussian, so it is somehow trying to do this, but in this case, particular case, there is we can see there is a lot of information loss. You see here. So it doesn't cover every part of the isotropic Gaussian prior. So we see that there is there is some space which is left in the space in the latent space. So the idea is, if we can have 
uh, if, we, if, if we do not force the approximate posterior to assume a shape of a Gaussian distribution, we can uh, efficiently utilize the, the space. I mean, we can, we, we can get rid of uh, this empty space. So if we have more expressive posteriors, we can get like we, the, the posterior can then pack, pack the space much better, like in, like in this case. But there are some requirements for, for uh, getting more expressive posterior. <coughs> for example, for the requirements uh, uh, are computationally efficient to generate uh, we it, it, it needs to sample like it's, it needs to be simple to generate samples from the distribution this distribution it shouldn't be very computationally expensive to generate G's from from approximate posture and uh, what are some models that are good at it I mean that can generate uh, G's easily. I mean not that computationally expensive. Some uh, some models are autoregressive models that we that we studied in previous weeks. I will not discuss about them. And the other requirements are that that uh, the posterior should be peri parameter. Para this is a long word and. <laughs> So what does it mean? It means that uh, that it needs to be parameterized transformation of simple noise source. Uh, we will talk about it uh, in the next slide. And uh, and uh, yeah, of course, the the the, the, the posterior should, should be of uh, uh, more difficult form. Like it shouldn't be simple Gaussian that we last saw that it was not able to pack the all the data points uh, efficiently. So it should be of various forms, multimodal distribution, and some other forms. So there are some works that this is this is actually uh, active uh, active area of research, and there are lots of work in this field. Uh, for example, the inverse autoregressive flow that we studied uh, in previous weeks. So this is about uh, this is kind of a small recap about inverse autoregressive flow. I will not cover this part, so you can. Uh, skip these slides. Yeah. So, so second second possibility of improving the uh, variational autoencoders uh, that I am going to discuss is why why if we if we can uh, instead of forcing the posterior. To assume shape of the prior, why not we force the prior to assume shape of posterior? So in this in this in this uh, slide, uh, if we like, for example, in this uh, in this particular slide, what posterior is trying to do is trying to pin pack the data points into the shape of a prior. Instead of doing this, let's uh, let's do the uh, opposite. Let's say that uh, okay, uh, the the posterior assumes this shape. Let's say that this is the shape of prior. Instead of forcing the posterior to assume the shape of prior, whatever shape the posterior has assumed, we say that this is the shape of prior, and uh, we can this is a fair like we can. Just uh, move ahead with this with this uh, assumption that uh, we are not uh, now we are not trying to go to the shape like we are not trying to somehow match the shape of posterior and prior. We'll just assume that whatever the shape uh, the posterior assumes, it's uh, it's the shape of the prior. It also has some requirements. Uh, for example. But the requirements are different from 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 previous uh, from uh, from having expressive posterior. So uh, I would like you to recall that what is 
uh, VLB, variational over 1. It is law of P of X given G plus tau of P step plus So, so this is the prior in this equation. So whatever the prior is, whatever the prior, whatever shape the prior is taking, it should do this computation efficiently. So it should be able to uh, evaluate evaluate log of p of g efficiently for any arbitrary for any g that we that we have for any uh, yeah. So this should be efficient enough for, for, for our expressive prior. And second obvious requirement is that it can be of any shape, any uh, difficult form, multimodal or any other form. So in this area as well, there are some works, for example, uh, AF, prior and VLA, and pixel CNN. So you can, you can read about these works in these papers. So the last uh, last topic that I'm going to discuss. So till now, uh, we are we are trying to uh, we are trying to somehow uh, improve variational order and borders uh, in a way that we can uh, that we are trying to reduce the difference between approximate posterior and true posterior, which is which is the variational gap. So we talked about. Uh, different uh, uh, posteriors and different priors. So what is happening in a generator? Uh, it is mapping the the information, the data points to a latent space. So what we are assuming that this latent space has more information, more compact information to represent the data. And then we feed this information to a descriptor net, uh, discriminator network to do some other tasks to do. Uh, to to do some uh, down uh, other task so so instead of instead of uh, instead of taking latent space why not we just focus on decoder i mean this is encoder and decoder if you <coughs> go with this terminology encoder is does take takes the data points encoded into a latent space so we are forcing this latent space to have more and more information instead of doing this why not have a decoder which is very powerful that have all the information that we need to do the, to do the machine learning task. So this is what I am going to discuss about is having more flexible decoders instead of having instead of focusing on uh, latent space and encoders. So what, what do we do till now? We use some simple distribution for, we use some simple decoders. That means we use simple distribution for, for, deco, uh, for decoder distribution, which is generally we have Gaussian, uh, we have logistic distributions. So what simple means here is that they themselves alone cannot capture all the variations in the data. So we resort to latent space to capture all those variations in the data. So instead of resolving to latent space, we like this is what written due to lack of expressivity itself, all entropy is pushed to G. All the information is pushed on to G, and G need to convey all the all the all lot of information. So instead, we will have powerful decoders. We will use the distributions which are more expressive. For our decoder. So, so, so let's uh, recap to VLB variational lower bound. So this is uh, so the upper bound of this uh, variational. Uh, the I mean the variational lower bound is upper bounded by the distribution of our data points. I mean, the distribution of, of the model, model's parameters. Okay. 
and this is this is again upper bounded by the actual distribution of the data so so this is our decoded distribution and this is the actual distribution of our data and you can say you can like this is the global optimum like beyond this you can't maximize maximize plp let's assume that the decoder completely ignores the latent space this uh, decoder distribution doesn't care about the g it doesn't look at g and it's good on its own to perfectly and it and also it perfectly equals the true data distribution it equals the true data distribution so now we just expand the equations uh, and we try to optimize the vlp so just expand we are just expanding the equations we have log p of x g so we see that this this doesn't depend on g this particular term so we take it out and we have assumed that this is equal to the to the true data distribution and we have finally this second equation and this part and uh, this this is a this is wrong here so it's a g sample from q g yeah this part of the equation is negative of kl divergence in q of g given x and p of g and we know that this is the global optimum this is the maximum uh, performance of, of that that can that an auto encoder can have as we like from here this is the same so so to optimize the vlp what the model will do it will <coughs> make it equal to zero because this is the global optimum this is the maximum performance it can reach so to make it to to optimize the vlp it will uh, it will try to try to equal the scale divergence to zero the approximate posterior the model will try to make this equals to the prior from this <clears throat> so what i'm saying this is this is happening with the assumption that the decoder is very powerful and uh, it doesn't need any information from the latent space it doesn't need to look for g because it is very powerful it just it will it have it has already the global optimum the maximum value our model can attain and so it will just throw out g out of the picture but this is the reason that we do not generally have that much powerful decoders and this is the reason we resort to latent variable models because if we have such decoder then we can simply we, then we do not need uh, latent variable models or we can simply ignore g this is what written here so uh, just come back here yeah. so uh, yes, like so you are saying what is bx given b is e data x so we basically are saying there is no dependence with of yeah. x on c yeah so then the conclusion is that any new information coming from x has no impact on p of b See, you cannot update to C given X because X has no dependence on B. So that's why to C given X is becoming B. Yeah, we have yeah. so there's no more dependence. Right? So the most optimal to C given X is easy because yeah. there is there two independent things from B. Yes. Yeah. So it's basically two way different. X is not dependent on B, so C doesn't get updated. There's no updation. Right? Yeah, we do not. Yeah, exactly. We we do not need to look for other. We are assuming that we have all the factors. We are assuming that we have in the data set all the factors that can affect X. So we just we do not need to assume some other distribution, uh, uh, variational distribution that can impact or affect uh, 
the performance of the model. We can just simply assume that the decoder is whatever the data we have. But, but this kind of thing doesn't happen in real life. I mean, doesn't happen exactly the same thing that we see in this slide. I mean, really, if you think about it, what does the decoder do then? Because the decoder is expecting some Z and its strips of X, right? That's what yeah. the decoder is yeah. supposed to do. It takes input as it, like if G but and it says it has no dependence on Z. So it just magically is taking out X's which are, I don't know, what, I can't even make sense of what is happening. Yeah. But it takes any random Z and gives its correct X's. Is that what it's trying to say? What does it even decoding mean? Decoding means uh, taking the latent but representation of the data and we ourselves that Z has no impact. Yeah, so we are assuming in this case. Some people people have tried uh, ignoring the latent code. I mean, latent represent latent space, but the results have not been very very good. That's why we need uh, latent space. So people have tried both the things uh, using some powerful decoders and using and uh, they have used uh, latent space as well. Both the things. It has very catastrophic effects. Using both the things doesn't do well. So some people thought that why not we uh, weaken the decoders and uh, use the latent space. So weakening the decoders, you can weaken the decoders. Like these are some of the papers that that have worked on worked in this direction. Uh, some have added dropouts in auto regressive regressive models. And uh, we have reduced the receptive receptive field of the pixel CNNs to kind of weaken the decoder models. And there are some other techniques people have tried. For example, changing the training dynamics, like they train some somewhat differently. And uh, yeah, so this is it. Next instructors can take over. Yeah. So how do you get to the point where the decoder is powerful? And so, so the, the discussion up till now is that the decoder is too powerful. There's no divergence. The prediction is basically based on the X itself. So mm -hmm. different methods proposed were there to reason. Yeah, because but they assume that the distribution of the decoder is the distribution of the data that we have. So if you go back to the page where there's a color of the map, this, uh, up again, the distribution of the 2D isotopic Gaussian. Yes. So that the powerful decoder happens when the decoder try to force the Gaussian of the data points into the prior field. Is that what it's meaning or does the powerful decoder mean something? Actually, this is uh, the latent space. So in this picture, we do not have any decoder. Yes, but, but how does it happen that the powerful decoder come about? OK, powerful decoder is a decoder which has, uh, like, a, we just assume the distribution of the decoder is the distribution of the data we have. So if we can plot the distribution of the data, and uh, uh, like, for example, what I'm saying, that we do not need to then map from this uh, from this space to this space. We do not need to map. We just assume that whatever the decoder is, it has the distribution of the data that we have. So in that case, we need huge amount of data to cover all the possible, uh, like to have all the information that the decoder needs. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not very sure if I understand it because uh, it seems like what they're trying to say is that having a powerful decoder is a problem. Is, is that the correct 
implementation. I think that's the like, like implementation. Like, if you have the powerful, if you have a powerful decoder, 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 it's bad. That's why we need weaker net. Yeah. That's but how, how do you get to the point of getting? Like, how do you train the model such that it's so powerful? Because representation of all the data points is impossible. What I'm saying, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to it. Why a decoder having powerful decoder is uh, bad? Because as we see in this in this slide, we just assume that the distribution of uh, the distribution is just equal to the data distribution. It's kind of our fitting, if you see. If we just uh, trying to make decoder learn the thing. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, memorize the data we have. I think, yeah, this because we are just assuming that whatever data, so it, it is not able to generalize much. So this could be the reason that they say, that's why the results, I, as I told you, the results hasn't been very uh, influential. They, they were not very impressive results. So the, how we assume the data decoder is powerful, we just assume the distribution of decoder equals to the distribution of the data, which is kind of memorization. And that's because when you're training a model, you're trying to fit the files with respect to what data is in there. That's why you have a problem with the or was it something an artifact or something else? Because it looks like the, the slides flow like this, right? So you explain the inverse variation. That means you're trying to feed the data back to the files. And because of doing that, you end up with a very powerful one. Is that what the slide means or is it something else? Can you say it again? So we are just trying to see what if this happens. How how can you play a model to get to this point? That's my question. Like how did they get to a point where you make this assumption that such a powerful decoder will exist such that you will regularize with some other things? Uh, how do we do it in practically you're asking, yeah. right? Uh, they didn't explain it. Okay. So I can't explain. It's okay. But I, I'll try to look for it and we'll get it. Okay. okay. Any Let's other? Thank our uh, speaker. <laughs> oh, unfortunately, due to power issues again, and we're just in chat box, so it's going to take a, a couple minutes to fix. Okay. Yeah, this is going to So we still have, uh, I call this like the three miscellaneous items left for latent variable models before we move on to GANs. Uh, yeah, so this is, oops, how do I move this down? <laughs> Sorry, not very good with this. Okay. How do I screw it? <laughs> okay, I don't need this. Um, okay, how can it's doing that? Yeah, strange. Okay. Okay, up and down then. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, we've got three items. Uh, the first one is on mutual information estimation and maximization, which actually was not really covered during the video lectures. Uh, there's also variational dequantization, which is going to be a variation forgive the pun, on uniform dequantization. And the last part is on more expensive architectures for improving VAEs. Okay, so first one, mutual information. So the definition of mutual information between two random variables is just defined as taking between X and Y, is just taking as the entropy of X minus the entropy of uh, X given Y. Or you could do it the other way around, which is the entropy of Y minus entropy of y given x. And there's this diagram just to show you the idea of this. 
right? Uh, why mutual information is a general way to measure dependency between two random variables. So in our case of X and Y, it's a way for you to measure how dependent the two random variables X and Y are. So lies the first, first question. Uh, don't we already have the idea of correlation? Uh, why do we want to use dependency over correlation? Okay, so the problem with correlation uh, is that does the lack of correlation imply the lack of dependence? Uh, no. And there's this very famous set of pictures that you can see. I mean, this first one is kind of, when you're doing regression, it's kind of what you expect, right? Okay. And then you have um, the second row that shows you perfect correlation, whether it's one or minus one. But when you have the last row, uh, all these have are uh, specially designed such that there's no correlation, right? But looking at the scatter plots, would you say that there's no dependence between X and Y? Or whatever the random variables are, no, right? There's dependence. So that's a problem. Okay. So the only point that they want to make about mutual information is that it is useful in a lot of settings uh, where you want to maximize the dependency between two variables, or you actually just want to estimate what is the dependency between the two variables. And they list uh, a few examples. I managed to find the paper. I, I've linked to the papers for the first two. Uh, because this is not mentioned in videos, I'm not quite sure what CPC is. If anyone knows what CPC is being referred to and you want to link it in the chat, please go ahead. But I managed to find only the first two. Okay, so that's all that's covered in the notes on dependence and mutual information. Okay, the next part is on variational dequantization. And for this part, we go back uh, to this idea that we covered, I think it was two weeks ago, about the idea of uniform dequantization. So what happens when you have image data which tends to be discrete from 0, 1, all the way to 255? The idea then was that you add noise to a data, and this noise is in uh, uniform between 0 to 1, right? And then you use the instance uh, inequality and you get this result. So this is kind of what you get yeah, when you one actually. Point, uh, yes. Yes, correct. Uh, yeah, but the, the main point here is that if you actually try to visualize what uniform dequantization looks like, you get something like this. So you end up with bars because you are just adding a uniform distribution to the PDF. Uh, the main problem with this is that you end up with a unit hypercube, which is unnatural. And the problem is that when you're using neural networks, you usually want a smooth function, but this is a very jagged step, stepwise kind of function that you end up getting. So the idea of variable dequantization is, is that you learn the noise Q using variational inference. Okay, so instead of just assigning a uniform uh, noise, you actually learn the noise using variational inference. And so, I mean, the idea is that you have this uh, log and then the Q, and then you use Jensen's inequality, and you end up with uh, a result that is kind of similar to uniform dequantization, except that because you now have this, 
So this is now an extra, you have an expectation of another expectation. Okay. So this is the difference now you get, you get the expectation of expectation. Okay, so what is the kind of like the intuition that was discussed behind this is that you want to learn uh, a dequantizational noise that is easy to fit. Okay, and it's described in the lecture as being finding points in the interval, which is actually easy for your model to maximize. And the idea of uh, this is actually analogous to a VAE. And as to how to train this model, uh, what is described is that you just train the models jointly. Okay. And in a way, if you actually think about this, uh, it will have some similar ideas to what we are going to talk about last, which is on more expressive architectures of VAEs. Okay. So the idea is that instead of just having normal latent variables, what if you have hierarchical latent variables? Uh, meaning that you are chaining your latent variables and it could be in a Markov chain. So this is the Markov chain and this is autoregressive, right? With the idea now that actually what you can do is that it doesn't matter whether it's a Markov chain or autoregressive model, you just take all the latent variables uh, together as one. So you just put them all together. And then you end up with this, this result. So what's the idea behind this, right? Uh, so Jonathan describes in the video that the idea is that you're kind of like nesting them because you have uh, this by itself is a, is a VAE. And then this is also one, but then you're just like putting, it's just like a VAE and a VAE and a VAE. Uh, why you wanna do this is that you have, when you have more latent variables, you have more powerful distributions and this gives you more modeling capacity. So this is the idea behind why you want to add more you want to do hierarchical latent variables and you want to have more latent variables. Okay. So what do you do with the, with the training of this, right? As we've discussed earlier, right? The idea is that you want to treat all the latent variables as uh, one latent variable. And we already have this that in the generation you just have uh, you just treat all of them together and you get this. And when you have this, you can just put it back into the variational lower bound. So this, this whole thing just goes in here. Okay. And it goes now goes back to a question of we know that the sampling is slow for this, right? So is this going to be a problem? Uh, yes, the sampling is going to be slow, but here you are not putting, you're not sampling for each pixel or each voxel or whatever you're trying to generate. You are defining some latent variables and in practice, your latent variable models will not have more than 20 latent variables. So yes, the sampling will be slow, but when you are dealing with an order of 20 latent variables that has slow sampling versus slow sampling thousands of pixels, um, this is not really a problem, not so much of a problem. Okay. And it just ends off with uh, some examples of inference networks for hierarchical models. So these are kind of like uh, a wrap up on some of the ideas that how do you extend them to more advanced uh, 
So if you are trying to sorry. I mean, it looks like only if I generate Z3 and then it automatically I mean I'm feeding it to Z2, then some output comes automatically which can fetch into Z1 and then finally gets to make the hash and some kind of text and decoding like that. The way it seems to be or you are saying you have to input Z3, Z2, Z1 like that and you have to come out. Yeah. So I mean, if you look at, if you unpack this, this equation with the product, right? Okay, what happens when it's, uh, it's Z2? It's just going to be P of Z2 to Z3, right? So it's going to be the same. It's going to be the same, sorry. It's going to be the same whether it's the Markov chain or the autoregressive, right? Yeah. And then when you actually go down to Z1, uh, you just end up that it's just going to evaluate this because Z1 does not depend on Z2, it only depends on Z2. But in this case, you depend on Z2, so you just evaluate it all together, it, it covers it. So you just write down the join that actually works for however you describe this. Yeah, it was still trained. I think I I mean the, the, the point is that you could it does the simplest form is going to be the Markov chain. And the most complicated is probably going to be the autoregressive in terms of the connections, right? So I think Jordan's point why he chose to outline these two architectures is that uh he shows you that it doesn't matter. It's the same for the Markov chain autoregressive and it works also for anything that is in between in terms of uh Com complicated pathways between the two. So you can have something as simple as a Markov chain that works because uh, you have uh, conditional independence from of some of the variables. And then even if the, all the variables are kind of like connected in some ways, then it still works. Yeah. I, I mean, the point is that you kind of decide how you want to set up this latent variables uh, structure that's hierarchical instead of uh, back in the case where we had to do every single pixel as, as one and in a sample. So this is kind of, you can use maybe additional knowledge you have about the data, about the process that you can, you can model it this way. And yeah, so there are some papers that they said uh, IFVAE, which is you stitch them together autoregressively over layers. Uh, and then you have some autoregressive flows. And then you have some that's uh, autoregressive structure over layers. So it's not over the dimensions of the data. But you actually, now you have, you define how your data is in layers and then use this as a hierarchical model. And in all these cases, uh, goes back to his point, that is 20 as compared to sampling thousand. So you're not so worried about the slow sampling speed. Okay, so uh, that's it for my part. And the end of the very long 
discussions that we've had on latent variable models. here if you make a lot of uh, annotations you just click here and say clear and you're all set okay uh, good evening everyone so uh, we have finished like the first session of this course and now we will be moving to the next part which is like implicit models rather than explicit models so we have seen autoregressive models flow models and latent variable models so if you see in all these three kinds of model, we had a common aspect that we were optimizing for likelihood. So either we were doing it directly or via variational bound, but the main objective was always uh, likelihood optimization. So, so can we do something else? So, uh, let's see, so if you want to build a sample, the simplest approach is whatever is in your data set, you just randomly sample that and output. So that's the very naive approach, but that is not a useful one. So we have already discussed why. So instead of that, like, so if you see this code, it is randomly picking from the sample. So it is randomly picking from the existing sample base. And so it is basically whatever your data set is. So you're randomly producing one of the outputs. So it's identical mapping, not much useful. So maybe that's why this caricature is. So ideally we want that uh, whatever new data we generate, it, it is like very smoothly interpolatable and there is not one-to-one -one mapping. And the output samples, the, the distribution of output sample closely resembles to the, the distribution which we are trying to mimic. So these uh, set of models are studied under the heading of implicit models. So the idea is same. So we have a fixed noise source distribution Z. So, and we pass it through a deep neural net and we obtain X. So we have seen these kind of things already so we have seen this in flow models and VA and all so the question is like what's the difference so the difference here is like instead of optimizing for maximum likelihood we will be optimizing for something else so at the end of the day we are trying to compare two probability distributions so if we can come up with some other metric which which gives a score of difference between these two distributions then maybe we can come up with uh, different approaches. So, so here the idea is we won't be directly learning the density via maximum likelihood. Rather than that, we will be having some different metric we will be aiming to optimize. So in these class of models, like GANs are very popular. So like I'll be initially talking about a different one and then it will be followed by the GAN. So in implicit models, the, the thing is like you have a data distribution and we want to uh, a sample, uh, we, want to, we want to generate a new sample such that the, the new samples are from a distribution which mimics the, uh, the existing data distribution. So we want, to, uh, so what we do is like we parameterize this uh, transformation from 
one distribution to other distribution via a neural net. So Z, if you see, Z is our noise input vector and phi is the parameter set. So uh, this will induce a, a density function, uh, uh, if you see P model, which is uh, trying to be as close to P data. So we, uh, we do not have an explicit form. So instead of that, we have a neural network which will try to have the same effect of having an explicit form. So since this is departure from maximum likelihood, and so we need some measures to uh, optimize for rather than creating a loss function based on likelihood. So instead of KL divergence, we have other measures like maximum mean discrepancy and JSD and earth movers distance. So in the first model, which I will be discussing, it's about like moment matching. So the idea is if we have two probability distributions and their moments are same, like first moment or higher order moments, then we can say that they both are the same distribution. So in the, the simplest of the moment is mean. So initially say we try to make sure the mean of both the uh, both the data set and the generated data is same then we are able to achieve our goal so so if you see here we are we are like focusing on this metric maximum mean discrepancy so this is defined here so we are trying to match the moments of the two distributions. So here is one typo. So if you see the square of this is defined as this. So phi is, uh, phi is a mapping which takes your input data to a higher dimensional space. And suppose if phi is identity, then the first expression becomes The first expression becomes mean, and this also becomes mean. So it is nothing but the difference of the mean we are optimizing for. So if phi is not uh, identity, then we can get higher order moments as well. So if you expand the Euclidean norm, and uh, you will get like uh, these three terms, and it's like after juxtaposition. So you can see here, we are having the cardinal trick. So it's a dot product of uh, two functions. So if we choose an appropriate kernel, we can write it in this way. And that will simplify a lot of computation. So everything will simplify if we have an appropriate kernel function. So there's a mathematical proof that if we use a Gaussian kernel here, then it will make sure that all the higher moments will be matching if, uh, if, if this metric becomes zero. Uh, okay, yeah. Great. Maybe this will have the audience. Uh, so they wanted to just show the like phi to kernel mapping, but this will have the terms. So here they are showing like if we have identity function at phi, it becomes basically mean. So that we already discussed. So if we have a kernel, something like this, which is a Gaussian kernel, then there, if you see this reference, there is a proof that uh, if we are able to make this ma metric zero with this kernel, then all the higher order moments will match and both the distribution will be exactly same. So this is one of the paper which tries to do that. So this came around in 2015. So just after the Ian Goodfellow paper on GAN, 
and surprisingly the results of uh, this approach was better on the data set they used but the problem is like they used a very uh, limited data set cfar and they were not able to scale well while gans can scale well the advantage here is that uh, it's easy to optimize these networks compared to gans optimizing gans is pretty difficult so here you see it's, it's a simple neural net and uh, you try to match the moment so the loss function here uses the previous metric we have discussed and you train it and that's how if you want to generate a new sample you input a uh, a noise and you will get a new sample in the second approach what they did was like they trained a auto encoder first so first a auto encoder was uh, trained then the encoder part was cut off and a generative moment matching network was used to to uh, feed the uh, input to the decoder part so the finally the generation uh, flow is like this so this uh, this approach gave much better result compared to this approach and this was able to beat the gan results on the two data sets they compared uh, why mm, no i don't think so it's like they were able to compare the maximum log likelihood it was better so they claimed it's better on these two data sets which is mnist and tfd not cfr sorry so i think this is some face data set so you can see the first thing these are a bit noisy compared to these ones these are a bit smoother the second one uses auto encoder and similarly for the second data set it's hard to tell difference here but for mnist data set you can easily see uh, these are more noisy compared to this and they don't have the table here but if you refer the original paper they have log likelihood numbers so the, it's better for the one if you use auto encoder so the idea is simple you you generate you have a data set so you uh, get a mini batch of the data and you generate the samples from the neural net and you calculate this metric we discussed earlier so once you calculate this metric you try to optimize it with, with respect to the weights of the network and then you do the usual back propagation and you optimize that for that metric so if it becomes almost zero that means now the distributions are matching and you won't be getting an exact result like it's not an identity function anymore so that's what the goal was so yeah so another thing is like instead of mean if you want to do higher order matching so if you use a gaussian kernel it will help you so there is a mathematical proof that if you use a gaussian kernel and if you expand it and maybe have gaussian kernel with different bandwidths you can get much better performance so yeah it it uh, it's easy to train the only thing is it doesn't scale well that's why i think after 2015 there was not much research into this approach and gans took off so i think now we will also head on to gans ah it's uh, yeah because the loss function is differentiable and it's easy. uh if it is a uni model it is yeah. yeah i think so that is um uh, but uh, this is not uh it's not mandatory to use gaussian kernel but still it works well because i think 
the this function is pretty well differentiable that that's what it was mentioned that it's easier to train because of the loss functions form so. there is a good reason why Yeah, it's the so same. SQL yeah. And it seems like if you expand on the RDF, you can see that it's actually a dog that we need to put a bank transfer for each of them, just to work on it. Just X is not okay for all of them. Right? So if you if you try to reduce the loss according to this curve, it means that what you're doing is to match all the moment, all the yeah, all the moment all the moment. And Gaussian kernel has other suitable properties as well. Like if you differentiate it, it still remains the same. Even if you do a transform on Gaussian random variable, it still remains Gaussian. So one, like uh, one paper like recent, not recent, maybe 16 or 17, that was MMD GAN. So which uses it for the initial part, I think. MMD is for moment matching, discriminator maybe. So then it is GAN. So I think it's somehow integrated with GAN. Okay. But yeah, if it works for low it damage. It works in high damage. For high, man, high dimension, it doesn't work. Like results are not good. Does anyone know what are any other kernels besides Gaussian kernel? Polynomial, uh, like uh, you can use any, but I'm not sure. Like whatever typically works with SVM should work here, like sure. because it's the same same technique. Yeah. Like say, like Eugene said, basically the RBF or, or Gaussian kernels try to match all the moments simultaneously, right? So it could be that some of the lower order moments are more important, right? Yeah, so for that, there is like one trick you expand uh, this using Taylor series up to something. Yeah. So you don't need to match the, all the moments. You don't see your hands Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that is the simplest kernel. Right? So, yeah, kernels, I think, by definition, they are supposed to be symmetric. Right? Uh, the, then it becomes your those kind of models again well, back to the same. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, here you can't. But if the objective function you change, it becomes the same. I think many will be doing it. Coupler in our other classes, right? We warned them about the non convergence, but they want to do it anyway. <laughs> I 
next one. You put it on Slack as well, right? Okay, let's go get it. Yep, there it is. Okay. How do it work? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This one for annotation. Okay. This one for race. This one for race racer. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, I something and uh, I just yeah, oh, that's all. Well. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, I think you can scroll up and down. Yeah, two okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, no, I don't need it. Yeah. So, So next, uh, I'm going to explain about the GAN, uh, which is Generative Adversarial Network. So GAN is uh, invented by the Good Fellow uh, a few years back. So, so before that, uh, let's uh, go back to the, what we have been studying. So, so far, we have been studying uh, some uh, generative, generative models, such as the autoregressive model or VAA. But basically, uh, this approach uh, like, uh, is uh, estimating uh, ex explicit density function uh, in the autoregressive model, for example, pixel CNN, uh, basically using up like previous data point x1 to xi minus 1. And by using these previous information, then estimating a, a density function. Also, v, uh, VAE uh, variational autoencoder also define the uh, if, uh, introduce a, a density function and, and then to generate a data point. But here, uh, approach of GAN is uh, different. So in GAN, uh, basically we give up to estimating an uh, explicit density function. But instead of that, uh, we just get a uh, uh, data point, uh, which, is, uh, which, which should be like very close to true data distribution. So idea behind the can came from uh, came from the game theory. So basically, try to like uh, play a two-player game. Uh, so I'm going to explain with uh, some uh, slides. So actually, this slide is from the Stanford lecture. So I'm using this uh, slide because I like uh, this is very like easy to understand and very intuitive. So. The idea of GAN is uh, try to train a network, and but uh, we try, but the uh, uh, idea is that we try to sample from a, a comp to express a complex and a high dimensional data. But uh, to do so, we uh, GAN is try to like sample from a simple distribution and uh, using a deep line, a neural network to generate a, a, like a data which. A, which is very close to a true data distribution. So basically input is a random noise Z and we just uh, input this noise into the gen generator network. Then we hopefully we uh, get a uh, like very uh, good looking data point. So in GAN, uh, we need to train two types of network. Uh, one is the generator network and the other one is discriminator network. So generator network, so uh, this network is basically get the input from random noise and uh, generating a certain output data point. Uh, but the generator network uh, is basically try to uh, optimize uh, so that a discriminator net, uh, network cannot be distinguished if this is a real 
uh, data or this is just a generated uh, fake data. So from the uh, discriminate, uh, discriminator point of view, uh, discriminator just uh, input the data uh, from the either fake image gener generated by Jan or just uh, in get the input from the real image from a training data set. And uh, this is a kind of just a uh, binary uh, crash fire to identify, okay, this input is uh, just provided from the actual data, uh, real data, or uh, okay, this data is uh, just a uh, fake data which is generated by generator, uh, uh, generator network. So basically uh, we try to train two, type, two uh, types of network in, uh, so that uh, eventually we get a very, uh, very smart, very clever generator network, uh, which is enough to like, uh, cheating a discriminator network. So then uh, next problem is, okay, so how do we formulate this uh, two player game? So uh, Guttofrero uh, introduced the one objective function. Uh, uh, this is a like minima, uh, so-called uh, minimax objective function. So let's see from the uh, discriminator network perspective. We call discriminator network as a D, D, C, that D. C, that D is a parameter of, uh, uh, deep learning network of discriminator. And so basically discriminator would like to max, uh, maximize that this objective function. So this objective function uh, consists of uh, two terms. First term is an uh, like, uh, expectation value such that uh, we, we can like be maximizing our like log uh, d theta d of x. So basically this d theta D of X is the output of the, uh, like a crash fire output. So usually uh, in binary crash fire, we output one uh, if the given data is the real data. And the ideal crash fire output value uh, close to zero if input image is a fake data. So uh, basically, so discriminator, discriminator is trying to uh, improving at this classification accuracy. So, and I, from the second term, uh, we see uh, expectation value of uh, log one minus d c d of g of z. So basically, uh, so g is a generator network and uh, z is a uh, input random noise. So basically generator network uh, out of the uh, data point, so such that uh, discriminator maybe like a misclassify, okay, this input is, uh, is come from the actual data sets. So which means the, to maximize this objective function, so ideal discriminator should output uh, close to zero in, in this term. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah, okay, oh, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'm talking about the second term. So basically this G, oh, oops, sorry. So this is a uh, generator function. So basically generator network uh, will uh, give an input to Z and then output to a data point. It's a kind of like, let's say X dash uh, and the D of X dash is a, like a kind of likely foot score to see if this is a real image or fake image. And the, from discriminator pass, uh, point, of view, point of view, X dash is a like fake data. So either discriminator should output a score which is close to zero or something. If uh, discriminator manages to do that, then this entire uh, objective function can be maximized. Yeah, this is a, 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 a maximization problem from the discriminator point of view. So on the other hand, 
generator perspective. Generator would like a uh, generator image uh, such that discriminator is like a misclassify. Okay, this is a real image, even though I input it as just a fake image. In that case, uh, discriminator try to train a network such that this term uh, equal to cross to one. In that case, second term is going to small, going to decrease the value. It's a, this is a, a equivalent to minimizing a, this entire objective function. So this is the idea, a basic idea of how to train a can. There are two players, and the uh, uh, discriminator try to maximize uh, this objective function, and uh, this generator is trying to uh, minimize uh, this objective function because they have a uh, like completely opposite purpose. So uh, to train each uh, deep learning network, uh, we, we do a gradient ascent and a descent as we do in usual deep learning uh, training. So the way we train deep learning network is the, we just train uh, al alternatively instead of training a discriminator network first, then after that we train the generator network. Uh, we, we usually don't do that and we, I will uh, explain a reason why later. But usually, uh, how we train GAN is, okay, first, first of all, we train a deep, uh, discriminator network and just using a fixed uh, generator network by using a gradient uh, ascent because this is a maximization problem. And we, uh, after we update a parameter of discriminator network, we just use a fixed discriminator and we try to uh, modify a generator uh, network parameter by using a gradient descent. Because uh, from the uh, generator point of view, this is a minimization problem. Then uh, after enough training, uh, just using a generator network to generate new images, because uh, we, we don't, no longer we need to look into a discriminator network because this is, Discriminator network is only required for training a better generator network. Yeah, so this is a basic idea behind the scan. Okay, I just skip. Uh, this is a, uh, exactly the same slide of what I have been discussing. So I just, uh, get some uh, good illustration for the how like uh, discriminator and the generator are moving. So first of all, uh, we train a gun, but uh, uh, we just initialize a, a discriminator and a generator network. So discriminator may not have a better classification accuracy. In that case, discriminator's uh, output looks like this. So uh, let's say like this black point is a uh, uh, true data distribution. And uh, the blue, uh, green line is a uh, data distribution generated by a uh, generator network. So either, uh, so either this parameter should be distinguished. Okay, so if we get the data point here, then it, this is more likely to belong to the, uh, uh, this data come from the uh, true data distribution. So this meta should out, output of value cross, which is cross to one. But the uh, initial phase, this meta is like, uh, not so clever enough. So this meta output something like this, like an unstable output. But after enough training, this meta getting smart, then this meta output, uh, value like this. Like uh, true data distribution is distributing here, but the generator is slight, uh, output is slightly like uh, shifted to right. So 
then smart uh, disk meter finding okay so this value should be come from the true data distribution because it's close to more center and uh, as we are uh, seeing a uh, more right side then okay this this is uh, uh, this looks more like fake, fake image so and uh, after a couple of training time generator uh, managed to generate more data distribution which is very close to the true data distribution like this Mm -hmm. Yep. So, okay. So let's say this is a kind of a score output by discriminator, and if this value is very high, which means discriminator regarding okay, this data come from the true distribution, and as we like a, okay, this is a let's say x-axis or something. So. Let's say we, if I get the data point here, then discriminator regarding, okay, this is more likely to fake image because true data, uh, true data distribution is like uh, locating in center. Yes, yeah, actually I had the same that when I reading the original paper, but um, I, um, I, I guess this is a kind of intuitive like uh, visualization, so maybe. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so then what, uh, okay, let's say like uh, we managed to train generator network very cleverly. Then uh, what happens for discriminator network? I mean, so if generator network is very like good enough to emulating a true data distribution, so what happens to this discriminator line? Do you have any idea for that? Ah, yeah. Ah, sorry. My question is the so currently discriminator output uh, distributor like this, but what if generator network is managed to become a very like close to true distribution? So what kind of output discriminator network uh, output? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So this is a bit, uh, bit answer. So if we manage to generate a network, which is the P true data distribution equal P generator distribution, then uh, output is comp like a, is uh, overlapping uh, together, and the uh, discriminator just output. Uh, by output kind of 0 0.5 because uh, discriminator is uh, less confident if this is a real image or a fake image. Okay, so let's go back to some mathematical formula. So let's deep dive into uh, some like a theoretical perspective of uh, objective function. So this is an objective function that we defined earlier. So this is, it consists from the G, uh, generator network G and the uh, discriminator network T. And the uh, first line is just follow the definition of the minimax uh, objective function. So then next line, what we do is we just uh, transform a form from the expectation value to the integral form. We just follow, uh, uh, transform this formula just following the uh, uh, definition of the uh, expectation value. So 
first term is just multiply p data and the log dx. And the second term is a uh, expectation in terms of z, z. So we multiply pz, uh, pz and the uh, multiply log one minus dg, dg of z. Then from second, third, uh, second term to third term. So what do, uh, we do is we just uh, transform a uh, variable from z to x. So what we do is we just, okay, we have a, a noise distribution, but uh, we just convert to uh, PZX distribution. And uh, we also convert uh, generator network G of Z into the just X. Then we have a, a, a common a variable X, so we can uh, integrate these two terms in, within the same integral. Okay, then, then, okay, so what we want to do is, uh, okay, so we want to see uh, like ideal discriminator and the generator network. What kind of mathematical analytical form uh, that uh, G and T have? Uh, this, is, uh, this is a uh, question that we, uh, I'm going to explain. So basically this is a objective function. So then, uh, from discriminator perspective, this is a maximization problem. So we want to maximize this. So which means we just take a derivative of the P up B under G under D. And if this derivative, uh, derivative become, uh, become equal to the zero, in that case, uh, The D, uh, D star is a uh, like optimal value because the if we like uh, take a derivative of objective function, we we can identify subtle point of its functions. This is what uh, we are going to do. So, and we just do use uh, some like a simple mathematical property, which is a uh, let's say like. Uh, a is constant, so constant multiply log y plus constant b multiply log one minus y equals zero. In that case, uh, variable y. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is just a kind of simple mathematical formula. Formula. This is a completely like deep, uh, independent from GAN. It's a just a simple high school math. So, if this uh, for this like a form of uh, function derivative equals zero, which means yeah, in that case the optimal y theta equal a over a plus b. And uh, okay, we find okay this is a uh, exactly same form as. Uh, Above, uh, above a uh, form of mass, so we just replicate this operation into this. So this, so in this case, uh, okay. So a is corresponding to p data x, and uh, b is corresponding to the pgx and the uh, log dx is corresponding to y and here this is a corresponding to okay uh okay log uh, sorry log, log one minus y and uh, this is log y then finally yeah we can derive that okay so if discriminator managed to train for optimal form then this this D star x should be a p data x over p data x plus p g x. Uh, 
Uh, I suppose it should be convex function. Uh, is it? Oh, is it? Oh. So, I mean, it could be Good point. But for it to be optimal, I guess the slide says optimal, so I guess the answer is the same. Okay. 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 Okay, so next page. So in this page, uh, okay, so we derive the optimal form of a discriminator network function. Then what we do is the, okay, we also try to find the uh, optimal form of the generator network function. So here what we do is we just uh, substitute uh, dx with a d star x, which is a p data, over p data plus pg. This is what uh, first to second term is doing. And uh, okay, so let me say from conclusion. So this uh, objective function can be converted into a sum form, which is the minus log four plus the two and, uh, and, uh, and sum up with the two KL divergence. But to do so, uh, uh, we need to do some tricky stuff. Uh, is that simply just the adding a plus log four in this formula and the two balancer formula also substitute a log four. And that this substitute uh, minus log four just to come directly come to here. And that this plus log four plays an important role, uh, plays an important role in, uh, to derive a KL divergence here. So, this is just a simple math. Log four equal to the log four is two log two. This is a very simple high school math. And uh, just a, two log two, just a splitting at log two plus log two. Then, uh, okay, so maybe I, okay, so I, prepare the white page to write the formula. <laughs> so what we do is the not so complicated. So what we do is the okay so V G given the optimal D star is the okay minus log four and plus Expectation, expectation value, log p data, p data plus p g, and plus log two, 
Log two is just come from here, one of them. And also, we have uh, another term which is, okay, originally come from log one minus d star x. Okay, let's write down log. And uh, one minus d star x should become a pg over pd plus pg. And also, we also have uh, additional log two. So we just add here. Log two is uh, independent, independent from uh, x, so we can uh, put into the expectation expectation formula. So and minus log four plus ex log and pd plus pg pd and uh, log two. I just use a, like a simple property of a logarithm. So, and also x log two and the pg and the pg over pd plus pg. Yes. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, you are right, you are right. So this should become a... Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yep. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so this is equivalent to multiply two. Yes, yes. Yeah. Reciprocal of reciprocal. Yeah. So one, yeah. Yeah, one divided by one over two equal to. Yeah, I'm doing exactly the same thing oh, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah. Yes, yeah, 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 thank you for pointing out, yes. Yeah, it should be just two, yeah. Simplify this and mm -hmm. simplify pd upon pd plus pg. Mm -hmm. That's two pd by pd plus pd. Yeah, so first of all, like I introduced new like two terms. One is a minus log four, and also introduced a plus log four to cancel it out uh, together. And the minus log four is just uh, still uh, keep existing here. But uh, plus log four can be consumed by these two terms. Yeah, it's a uh, bit tricky, but uh, the, simply the purpose to try to create uh, this form is just uh, like deriving a two KL divergence uh, terms. Yeah, this is uh, just uh, like kind of ma tricky mass On, only for deriving a uh, uh, to diver, diver, uh, divergence here. So finally, we uh, managed to prove the formula. Okay, so I delete some red lines. So 
So finally, uh, we get uh, to this form uh, minus log four plus two summation of K divergence. And but this is uh, these two K divergence is a so called Jensen Shannon divergence, which is JSD. And actually, that yeah, this JSD has a uh, like a interesting property. So first, of, uh, okay. So basically, JS divergence can be like this JSD P data from P G equal uh, these two terms. So interesting thing is that uh, this JSD is uh, symmetrical, uh, sy symmetric. So as you know, K divergence is uh, not symmetric. If we switch uh, order of the uh, first uh, argument and the second argument, we will get a defined result. But the uh, JSD is a uh, will have a, give a, a consistent result. So basically, JSD satisfy uh, property of distance. Uh, that's a uh, uh, difference. So basically, GAN is try to like optimize that. Uh, networks so that JSD is uh, close, uh, getting close, closer to zero. Uh, this is a difference what we have been seeing for other like approach to for the generative network, uh, generative models. And uh, ideally, a p data and p g equal zero. In that case, we manage to generate a perfect data. In that case, this object of function become a minus log four. So this is a uh, the <clears throat> lower bound of the this objective function. Uh, actually, I have. Yeah. Yeah. I. Yeah, we still have. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Even not halfway. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, we will have another presenter today. So. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have a good starting point? Ah, uh, okay. So, okay. May May I try to explain and give the this page? Yeah, because uh, story is uh, kind of sequential. So, okay. So let uh, we have a couple of slides to go. So, yeah. Okay. So. We introduce a, a new di uh, distance metric, which is JS divergence. So let's see how it behaves differently. So this is a, a picture from given from the some academic paper. So this is a this uh, this chart is illustrating how each divergence behaves differently. So here, like left hand side, this is actually data distribution. It's a uh, generated by isotropic Gaussian, and uh, it's a mixture of Gaussian. There are two modes. So what we try, uh, what this paper try is to estimating a, uh, uh, okay, okay, uh, 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 generating a like a generating a sample uh, to to uh, to generating a to close uh, which is close to actual data distribution. So. And that this paper try to use a uh, multiple metric to optimizing a gen generative uh, model. One is a KL divergence, and uh, this one is a maximum mean discrepancy, what we have discussed earlier, and uh, this one is a JS divergence. So we, we can see KL, if we optimize to me, uh, if we try to minimize a KL divergence, what we see is, is uh, this kind of one, like one mode distribution. And then mode is uh, locating uh, in between like actual true mode. Uh, I will I will explain, explain why it happens. And uh, from the MMD and the JSD, what we observe is the uh, instead of like uh, having a midpoint mode in between, we we see what we see is a uh, we have uh, like a one. 
generated data is like a distributing in like a specific mode, and the JSP is more aggressively this, uh, generating a data uh, around the actual one one mode instead of having a like a midpoint mode. So why it happens? So I'm going to explain why the reason why. So okay, so. Basically, uh, for normal KL divergence, uh, formula is, okay, so, okay, this is a comparison between the normal KL divergence and the reverse KL divergence. So let's think of the normal KL divergence here. So basically, this KL divergence is uh, Px. So Px is a true data distribution, and uh, uh, Qx is a, uh, distribution that we would like to estimate, we would like to optimize. And the actual data distributes like this, like there are two modes. Two. But uh, if we try to, uh, if we optimize uh, by using a normal KL divergence, what we get Q is uh, distributed like this. Q. This is a, uh, the reason why we have this kind of result is that, so this is a KL. So if we want to optimize uh, minimizing a, a KL divergence, what we have to think of is the, okay, if QX value is very small, What happens, uh, this is a, a denominator, so entire k value uh, become uh, getting bigger if kx is very small. So which means we have, like we, k have the incentive such that qx, uh, okay, so uh, px is uh, getting zero if, Qx is very small. Oh, no. Ah, sorry. I I I don't know what you're doing. So, I mean, ah, so hold. Ah, what I'm going to explain is the. Okay, so Qx is a distribution what we want to generate. So. So to minimize the KL divergence, so what do we want to do the, So basically, uh, we want to uh, minimize the KL divergence. So which means if K, uh, we estimate a KX to like getting a very smaller value, it's, this, is very, uh, this is not good because uh, entire KL value is getting bigger. So which means minimize, uh, minimizing a KL, uh, KL divergence means uh, we estimate a function such that this value is less likely to take a zero. If we take a zero value, this value goes to infinity. So by giving this kind of uh, incentive, Kx is getting like a function such that uh, try to covering a multiple, uh, try to not to having a zero value in like many area of X, something like this. Yep. So basically, wherever there's any blue bands in your distribution, there must be some green bands to cover it, right? We don't 
care whether they're being asked to share your phone. That, that's okay. So that's that's the whole response to this bill, right? He was high. Uh, it's okay because basically it doesn't factor in the end of the end, right? Yeah. Yes. So, okay. On the other hand, uh, okay, we are going to see a reverse scale, which is a scale divergence uh, Q from P. In that case, what we get is that this kind of uh, distribution, which is more concentrated to one specific mode. Then why it happens is, uh, okay, let's write the formula of K reverse scale divergence. So QX and the PX. So in this case, uh, if we minimize uh, this objective function, what kx is going to do is the, okay, let's say like in this point, px is almost zero. And, uh, and if kx is not zero, it means that uh, kl, uh, Case divergence getting very bigger. So, which means we give an incentive such that instead of uh, uh, such that Qx equal zero if Px is very uh, like smaller value. By doing so, uh, Px uh, distribution Qx is try to fit to one spe one specific mode like this. If we cover, let's say, P uh, Qx like this, which means Qx has a non-zero value, even though Px is almost close to zero, which is uh, like a, which is bad case to, from the minimizing of scale divergence point of view. So this is the reason why we have a different uh, behavior among them. So, okay, so let's go back to this page. So. So it explains why we observe different uh, data distribution from uh, between K divergence and JS divergence. So basically, JS divergence is a kind of the up average, uh, like a, taking a like a two, like a averaging a like uh, normal K divergence and the reverse K divergence. So then, uh, if we optimize this uh, divergence, what we get is the instead of having a kind of uh, wide, widely spread distribution, but we are going to have more mode cent uh, specific model centric distribution. Yeah, this is the reason why we get like this. Okay, so this is our last chat for today. So then next question is, okay, which is good, which is bad? Uh, actually, yeah, there is no answer. Actually, answer is, uh, it depends. Like, for example, like if we, generating a very like sharp image. In that case, we prefer to like uh, use more reverse scale centric optimization because uh, if we get um, like a uh, mode value in between actual two, two mode distribution, then we get a more bur a bur image. But a sharp image is better if we generating a like, real looking image. But in some application, it might be better to cover like whole area by like estimated Q, like generated value. So it depends on application, which is good, which is bad, but uh, basically can is uh, try to optimize, uh, optimize the JSD, which is kind of uh, like averaging uh, reverse, uh, normal scale and reverse scale. Yeah, yeah uh, that's all for today. Yeah, I still have uh, a <laughs> many slides, but uh, yeah, let's see us here today.
Scans are there just to directly, basically give you, uh, you know, uh, just a good example. You really don't care. And then there's all these problems with, with when you are having a multi-key algorithm that I think I'm now what the person is having. Um, sorry, you said something. Sorry, it's a mixture. Lecture there, and then week seven is uh, final one for the first batch, and the week seven uh, after lecture we are turning to the whole bar. So uh, please join us if you have the bandwidth and time. Uh, very happy to go drinking for a short while. Even if you don't drink, like I'm not allowed to take alcohol, you know, you can drink water, it's fine too, or you can eat French fries or whatever it is that you eat with bars. I'm not actually going to show myself. Uh, sorry, next week is research is at the same time. Same time. Okay, let's, let's have a good round of applause for Paco. You guys have all of your project uh, title, not the abstract, just the title, okay, on, uh, on the document. So it depends on your group. So one, one title. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, it's nice job putting the slides together from the Stanford group. We did them too last year. Did you, did you do the again last time for, for the for the other course? Uh, uh, no, but I, I was uh, lecture from the Stanford to other students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is also the first thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We covered it last time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Yes.